Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. We're really, really uh, excited to have you in one of our very first uh, webinars. Um, my name is Raji Barham, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Amigo Cloud. I am here with uh, Daniel Caldwell. Daniel. Hello, I'm Daniel Caldwell. I'm the director of GIS for Amigo Cloud. And basically, Daniel and I have been working on GIS for over a decade and a half since our early days at S3, and we're really, really excited to uh, have you here because uh, in exchange for your attention today, by the end of this webinar, uh, our goal is to enable you to, in less than five minutes, to be able to set up a geospatial project so you can leverage the cloud, mobile devices, and uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is that uh, we have, we want this webinar to be interactive. Um, so we have a few ways uh, that you can use to interact with us. If you look at the GoToWebinar interface, uh, what you realize is that on the lower section, there is a, a part there where you can uh, send us questions. Um, if you type in there anything that, you know, it doesn't matter where we are, any question that you have, please feel free to uh, type it there. And as we're going through this, um, we'll keep an eye on it and answer those questions. So, uh, all right, uh, let's get started. Uh, before we jump into the tutorial that I talked about, I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about the current trends that we're seeing in tech and how they relate to GIS. Uh, the reality is that we have come a long way since the early days where we had to carry around programs and punch cards, of course, right? Uh, we all know how we transitioned from old mainframes to PC desktops uh, at the end of the last century. The main idea there, though, is that uh, we, we switch from having our own local computer where every time that we wanted new functionality, we have to install software from CDs, right? Install software. This is where uh, we were at the end of the last century. Uh, however, if you actually really think about your daily usage, you'll realize that uh, nowadays we have switched a lot to a new model where with, without even knowing about it, right? We don't we use Google all the time, but we don't install Google in our local machines. We don't install Gmail or Facebook, all these services uh, that, that exist that, that are part of our daily life. We just go to a website, log in, and there's basically a wealth of functionality available to us. Um, it, and in the cases like in Dropbox or other systems where we install something, uh, it, it's barely a small little program uh, that enables us to leverage thousands of servers uh, somewhere else, right? And this else is what we refer to as the cloud. Now, this new model is called SaaS, is uh, software as a service, right? Uh, it, Usually the model is that this software is either free or it's paid on a monthly and yearly basis without you having to install anything. You just use a thin client, you log in, and all the functionality is there. So that, that's one interesting trend that we're starting to see in cloud. Uh, another interesting trend is that open is becoming the norm uh, and not the exception like it used to be. Uh, so there's two elements to this when we talk about open, right? The first one is open data. So the, the idea that some data should be freely available, right? Uh, this has uh, created interesting projects like OpenStreetMap, for example, right? It, it's a project that is very relevant to us that is becoming more popular every day, right? It, in addition to that, we are starting to see a lot of momentum around the idea of cities, local governments, uh, also pushing and all their data out through uh, some new open portal that they launch, right? This all this openness around the software and the data is it, actually a good thing for us because basically it enables us to have more base layers, more more wealth of data that we can use to improve our current GIS data sets. Now, in the area of open source. Uh, you know, being able to look at the code behind the software, it's obviously becoming more popular. Um, it definitely powers cloud services everywhere, right? And yet there is tons of confusion around what open source really is, right? Like one of the first misconceptions that people have is that mainly 
they believe that it is an either on proposition between their proprietary system, whatever that may be, and the open source alternative, right? And it is not, actually, that, that's incorrect. You can actually use open source software, and proprietary software side by side. Um, a second misconception that usually happens around the area of open source is that uh, people usually compare open source against commercial software. So they use this term and it's like, no, I, I, I don't use open source software, I use commercial software. And th that is actually incorrect. Um, open source software can be commercial too, right? With support from a vendor. Um, and, and believe it or not, you're using it without knowing that you're using it. That's that's the beauty of a cloud. Um, so that's the second trend. And, and the last trend here that we see is that um, basically mobile. Mobile is uh, it's powering, it, it's the devices that we have in our pocket, it's cloud power. Uh, we can get, the reality of it is that, you know, we can play wonderful complex games that leverage the hardware and the sensors in our devices that are getting like more powerful every, every day and every day. Yet our geospatial software is still basically stuck in what is 1999, right? Um, for people, an example of this is for people collecting GIS data. Um, internet connection is intermittent; it is not always available, uh, and yet we're most of the time we're still stuck with pure web applications that we're accessing through our mobile device that do not work when the internet is gone. Right? Our Gmail application and our phone is able to cache edits emails locally while while in offline mode and sending them uh, when an internet connection is available and so should uh, our GIS software, right? Um, what we're trying to do with Amigo Cloud, what we're aiming to do with this is, is to create really a, a simple to use geospatial platform that enables people to take avan advantage of all these new trends. We want to make it powerful and yet as simple as possible. And then those two things usually uh, fight with each other. Uh, one thing uh, that is interesting to us is to try to understand a little bit more uh, what you are currently using within your organization. And to do this, uh, we have a, a very simple poll uh, that we want to ask you and take a, a few minutes here to uh, understand this a little bit more. So I'm going to start a poll. What we want to understand is what type of uh, geospatial software uh, you're using currently. So basically what we can see here is that uh, most of you are using proprietary desktop GIS software. Um, and some of you are using open source desktop GIS software. I assume that's something like QGIS or something similar like that. Um, mobile iOS seems to be uh, more popular than Windows. Uh, in other devices, which is honestly sur surprising to me. And it's great to hear. Um, and some cloud geospatial software. Excellent, excellent. This helps us uh, frame this a little bit better. We, when we look at the current uh, SaaS geospatial market, uh, what we're trying to do here is solve this five things correctly um, in as simple as possible, right? Is basically when we're talking about collecting data, we want to use modern devices. We don't want to use an old Windows mobile phone. What we want to use is uh, you know, an iOS, an Android device, something that you have in your pocket already. Um, when we're talking about um, managing data, uh, we're talking about collaboration, right? We want to be able to have multiple people working on the same GIS project. Uh, so usually what that means is um, if you think about how people do collaboration around Google Docs, right? There's a, a Word document. Multiple people can edit it at the same time. They can add comments to it. We want to bring that to GIS. Um, at the same time, if you have some file formats that you cannot read, you should just be able to, with a few clicks, generate KMLs, CSVs, uh, uh, file geo databases, whatever it is that you need, uh, you know, without having to worry too much about uh, the internals. Um, the cloud is powered by a whole bunch of very, very powerful servers, right? So that enables us to be able, you don't need to have a $25,000 server 
you know, running locally, um, with a few clicks, you can uh, do heavy geoprocessing on this. Um, we want to enable that. Uh, visualization, obviously, with a few clicks, you can create web maps um, and, and data portals, right? Sharing the data behind the maps that you created, we believe is an important uh, part of the open ecosystem. Um, so let, let's just stop talking about trends and let's start talking a bit uh, about a real world example, something that uh, we did with a customer. Oh, this is an image of the, River, the Riviera Country Club in uh, OpenStreetMap, so it's got no data. What they wanted to do was to go from something that looked like this, a black canvas, to something that looked like that, right? Uh, be able to collect all the sand traps, the fairways, the greens, the holes, uh, but with a tiny little twist. Um, if you actually zoom in enough to these, you will realize that it's actually of very high quality. The precision is much, much better than uh, the imagery. Uh, Daniel, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um, so they had some specific requirements that were well suited to Amigo Cloud. One, they wanted to collect using their iPhones. They all have iPhones. They all have Android devices. They didn't want to heft around large, um, you know, proprietary uh, mobile devices that are used just for that one purpose. They wanted just to be able to use the, the devices they have in their pockets right now. Secondly, um, for a golf course, they require high precision data, accuracy better than five centimeters. To do that, they need to use um, RTK um, in conjunction with GPS in order to get that kind of precision. They also have very, lots and lots of people working together whenever they're at a golf course. Um, there's easily dozens and dozens of people set, doing everything from setting up buildings to doing the GPS measurements to helping the golfers become um, situated with the golf course. Um, and so they want to be able to leverage the large groups of people that they have in order to get the job done quickly. Um, they also will take photos and geotag those and then later on they wanted to be able to keep track of that data from year to year. Um, they go back to the same golf courses uh, year after year, and they want to know the changes that have happened in that data from one year to another. Are the fairways getting smaller? Are they getting bigger? Are they wider? Um, you know, is the holes have the holes been moved? Um, that kind of situation. Um, so that that made that made it for a really good case for Amigo Cloud. Great, thank you. Um, let me move the questions over here. All right, great. Um, so instead of us keeping talking about this, uh, what I want to do is basically run through a demo that shows how they got the entire project uh, working, uh, you know, basically in less than a few minutes. If you click here and sign up, you can create an account and do exactly what I'm doing. Um, since I already have an account, I'm just going to go ahead and log in with it. And the idea with Amigo Cloud is basically that it's a very collaborative project. So if you see here, the very first thing that you see is a whole bunch of projects. These are all projects that have been uh, shared with me. So it's either people doing data collection, people looking at real-time data. Um, each one of these projects has basically users that have been assigned to work collaboratively on this or uh, data sets or customizations of mobile uh, data collection forms, uh, queries that have been saved. All I have to do is create a project and click on users and start inviting all the people that are going to help me in this data collection. So here I am going to invite Daniel as an administrator. Now. The very first thing that I want to do, I'm going to move this over here so you can see my, my data. Um, the very first thing I'm going to do is create a data set uh, from scratch. We can see from a message over here that Daniel has already joined me. He went to the website and did that. 
Uh, to create a data set from scratch, all I have to do is define the fields of whatever it is that I'm going to be data uh, doing the data collection of. In this case, it's uh, fairways in a golf course. So I'm going to create a data set called fairways. Uh, and I'm going to call it raw. I want to collect a uh, text field, so whole number. Uh, perhaps I want to do some uh, geotag photos. So I'm going to add a photos field. I'm going to be collecting the geometry of a particular area. So I'm going to call this shape. You can call it really whatever you want it to be. And it's going to be of type uh, polygon. There are other fields that are available here, including relationship classes is something more complex to actually support uh, revisit workflows and other things that Daniel is going to go over actually. Um, and then I click uh, save changes. That's pretty much everything that I have to do to uh, get going with the project. Um, what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to reflect my phone. So you can see it here. Perfect. So I'm going to delay. I'm going to put it on this side. I am going to, what you can do is go to the iTunes store. If you have an iPhone device or an Android device, um, what you can do is go to the iTunes store and uh, or, or the Google Play store and download uh, the Amigo Cloud application. You'll see exactly the same thing that I'm seeing. What I will do here is I want to collect a fairway. And I'm going to do a raw one first. So Riviera Golf Course. First find where that is in the world. Perfect. Riviera, oh, this is a country club. Oops, there's another Riviera golf course. This is a country club. Perfect. Um, and so if I look at my table, my table is empty. Um, I am able to actually start doing some data collection on the web. So let me start by showing you that. Um, to create a new record, I can just digitize something from my web interface. Whole number. I'm going to call the whole number zero because it doesn't really exist. Hit save. The record gets submitted to, uh, to the cloud. The cloud takes care of fixing any geometry problems if there's anything like that available. If I open my mobile device and I tap on it, what I can see is that the record has already been synchronized with me. Now, what's interesting is that I can use my mobile device now to go out and add a new record. To do that, all I have to do, we're trying again, we're trying to aim for the simplest workflow possible. There's a big plus button here. Hit on the plus sign. I, I'm going to do manual digitizing of that record. I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to take the photo that I talked about. So hit OK. Hit save, done. Then what happens is if the mobile device has an internet connection, it will synchronize uh, with the cloud. If the mobile device does not have an internet connection, you can still do the data collection. It will just work in offline mode. Um, so that's great. Now I can add records and uh, collaborate on it. So I'm going to move this over here and show you that I can click on the photo. The photo is there. It's all there. That's great. Now, what happens uh, when I'm walking around? Obviously, I'm not going to be digitizing with my with my uh, finger, right? Like The one thing that I really want to do is to start adding records that 
that are snapped to my current uh, location using the GPS on my device. Um, to do that, basically what I can do is I can zoom into where I am by hitting on the zoom to button and I can use this tracking feature. Basically what it does, so I'm gonna show you two things. The first one is collecting raw. If I hit the plus button, it snaps to my current location. If it snaps to my current location, then basically uh, I am getting, in this case, by hitting the eye, I can look at the current GPS and say, oh, I'm getting an accuracy of about 10 meters around here. When we were doing the golf course, we were paired with a high precision GPS over Bluetooth that was giving us uh, five centimeter precision, actually two in certain cases. When you're not paired to uh, something like that, your iPhone will typically give you about five meters if you're outside, 10 meters, 25 if you're inside. Uh, if you have an iPad device that does not have a GPS and uses Wi-Fi triangulation, it's going to vary. So every mobile device is different in terms of the precision. Um, if I hit OK and I hit Save, then uh, that record gets obviously saved, synced on the cloud. That's awesome. Um, what happens when I already have some base data, right? We're talking about ETL constantly. Um, if I already have some base data, then all I, I can actually import it in here. Um, all I have to do really is hit upload. And I'm going to go here to my uh, the data that Daniel actually collected. Um, all I have to do really is put all the shape files or file geodatabase or CSVs or KMLs or GeoJSON, whatever it is, zip it and uh, upload it. So this is exactly what I'm going to do here. Um, what Amigo Cloud is doing in this regard is um, it's figuring out, once you're uploading it, obviously, we figure out what the projection is, we project it on the fly, we figure out uh, what the geometry fields are, uh, we create spatial indices on them, uh, we figure out uh, the format, CSV, KML, GeoJSON, whatever it is, and, and basically just take care of choosing the right parser and load it to the cloud. Now, all the data that I just uploaded, which was a file geodatabase, um, it's available here now. So if I click, for example, under fairways, uh, from the data that uh, Daniel already loaded, uh, it's all available there. Uh, now, what it's interesting is that what Daniel did is he used our tracking feature. So to do that, basically, he added the plus button. He clicked on this start tracking button, hit play, and then put the phone back on his pocket. What this would do is take this little guy, and as I'm walking around, it would start digitizing. And then once it finishes uh, digitizing, uh, you can create geometries out of it. If you're interested in figuring out how that works, please, uh, you know, uh, it's in our help documentation. Ask the question, we'd be happy to uh, show you how that works. Uh, right now, I'm obviously sitting here, so the little guy is not moving, right? If I were moving around, it would just automatically be digitizing that. I'm gonna stop that, and not save it. Um, so that's the data collection part. It's very, very simple. Uh, something interesting that I want to show you here is that as I was talking, the data that I uploaded got automatically synchronized. I'm going to turn off my raw data and leave that data on. And you can see that the data is already here. What's really, really interesting to us is that we want to be able to make it so somebody can create a meaningful data out of this, right? So for example, um, right now, every single one of these uh, fairways has a whole number associated with it. But we want to create a map with a few clicks, create a map that is simple. So if we go into our styling options, I can go and create a category renderer. I can go and pick the, the field that I'm interested in. I'm going to say create 19 categories. Hit save, and basically I have a very simple uh, 
symbology based on the categories. I can obviously go here and start changing color, start changing transparency, um, and get as fancy as I want. Um, I can also go and, you know, label it if I'm interested in doing that. What's interesting is that the phone itself picks up on that and renders it immediately. All this data that I have on my mobile device is available offline. I don't have to do absolutely anything. It has been replicated. We make a big distinction between uh, submitting changes and actually replicating into the mobile device. What this device is doing right now, it's replicating all the data. If I turn off my internet connection, it will be available there. Um, okay, so there's that. So let's see what we have here. Perfect. Um, we have a question. Uh, how do we get better accuracy from with an iPhone? Better than five centimeters is basically by pairing an external GPS device. You can get uh, pretty good like sub meter uh, with uh, you know a Bluetooth that it's around two thousand uh, dollars each. Um, if you spend about $3,500 for an external GPS device, um, what you can do is uh, enable it with uh, an RTK. Um, and there's RTK stations all over multiple places that are, that are free, right? Um, so if you configure it and you have an internet connection, you can get up to two centimeters with an iPhone without a problem, which is really, really cool. Thank you for that question. Um, one more thing I want to show you. So we were able to show with a few clicks how is it that I can create a map. Um, if I wanted to share this map with somebody, all I got to do is click public map. I get a link. Um, this is the map that has all that data available. I can go and click and share this link with somebody else. Because I marked it as public, they're going to be able to go there and uh, look at this data. So that's awesome. Um, I want to step back. Obviously, I've shown how is it that you can do data collection. I've shown how is it that you can create some uh, uh, web maps with a few clicks. Uh, I want to talk a, li a little bit about something that I think it's not truly being leveraged right now, which is geospatial, geoprocessing in the cloud. Um, and to do that, uh, I wanted to get a sense of who of you has heard about Postgres. I think this is going to be important for us. Uh, who of you have heard of uh, PostGIS and know about PostGIS SQL? From the results, what I can see is that a lot of you are actually uh, familiar with uh, PostGIS, uh, about 63% of you. Um, some of you have not heard of PostGIS, so let, let me just do just very brief uh, explanation. PostGIS is the spatial extension of Postgres. It's an open source uh, geospatial database that you can go out and download and whatnot. Uh, what Amigo Cloud does is we leverage a lot of open source. So we've taken the PostGIS engine and basically exposed it through you, uh, to you to, through a, a web interface. So you can grab your little iPad that has almost uh, no processing power, the old one, and type a few SQL queries and be able to do geoprocessing uh, heavy geoprocessing that leverages our entire cloud infrastructure. I'm going to give you an example of that here. If you click under advanced queries, and right now we're still working on the, the documentation, it will be all available under help.amigocloud.com. Um, you can find a lot of information about how to write geospatial SQL. I'm going to show you a quick example of how this works. Um, what I can do with SQL is basically manipulate the data um, you know, that is stored in the cloud. So for example, I can do queries that say, show me all the records that are on the fairways. And by doing this, um, I have basically tabular results on the left side. Um, this string went out to the cloud. It looked at all the spatial indices. It leveraged all of our uh, servers in the cloud came back and generated an answer, right? Here, what I can see is all the records that are on those fairways. Now, what is interesting is that I can start doing a filtering on these things. So I can say, 
square whole number, let's say, show me all the records where the whole number is um, bigger than 10. So that's going to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way to 18. And those are only the records that are over 10. Now, uh, the reason why I mentioned PostGIS is this PostGIS, that's what you've seen so far is traditional SQL. What PostGIS gives you is geospatial SQL. I can start doing geo processing in the cloud by using these strings. For example, I can say, um, instead of just giving me all the records, what I'm interested only is in the geometry and in addition to that what I want to do is create a buffer around it now this is in uh, decimal degrees now I don't know how many of you so here's a 0 0.001 decimal degrees and you say okay that's great that's decimal degrees decimal degrees doesn't mean anything to me I am like not I can't figure out how much like 0.001 is in, in meters, for example. So PostGIS enables you to do a buffer, but also to start projecting on the fly into different uh, coordinate systems, intersections, differences, all this available through a SQL engine. So what I'm going to do here is say, turn this, uh, and of course, you know, PostGIS is, could be an entire uh, webinar of like, <laughs> many many hours so i'm just gonna I, uh, i'm gonna show you one example here which is i'm going to grab that geometry i'm going to turn it into this thing called a geography type which basically means that i'm going to start interpreting this as a uh in, in meters so here what i'm saying is like buffer it by 10 meters once i execute that oh and then i have to turn it back into a geometry of polygon type that uses a geographic coordinate system, our very well-known 4326, the classic uh, geography, uh, WGS84. So what I have here is I've done geoprocessing in the cloud. If I go and overlay my original fairways, what I can see is that I've created a 10 meter buffer around it. Now, what I can do is uh, one question that we had when we were showing this to the people of the PGA tour was like, well, I want to know how long that is so that I, I know how much rope I need to put around these things. So the beautiful thing about it is that we can grab that and use another operator here, for example, perimeter. Show me the perimeter of this whole thing. And I want the perimeter to be a meter, so I'm just going to leave it here. And uh, I'm going to name that field perimeter in meters. And here you go. I know the perimeters in meters. I know the buffers of all the holes that are bigger than 10. And so it being beautiful like this, perhaps I also want to add the, the hole to my result. And now that I have the data that I want, I can create eight. I can either save the query so I can execute it as many times as I want, or I can create a permanent data set. And what this does is it enables me to go back here and have the answer that I want as a data set. Perimeter data set. Now, being in the cloud, I can hit export and turn it into CSV, KML, file geodatabase, GMT. If I want to get GeoJSON back, I can do that. If I want to go and generate a KML, for example, I can request the export, go over here, open the, uh, the data, and, okay, oh, go 
to my downloads and here is the data set that I created. The KML available has been emailed to me. If I have Google Earth, which obviously can, or, or any other um, RGIS software, they can read that data, then here's the data um, with the 10 meter buffer. Clicking on it will tell me how much the perimeter is in meters, all with a few clicks in the cloud with no software installed in my local machine. Uh, so that's great. Um, the next thing, and the last thing that I'm going to show you, I know that we're running out of time, is uh, how is it that I can share the underlying data? I already showed, showed how to show the, the map, but if I wanted to go and create a simple data portal so anybody could download this data, I can click data sharing. I can pick the data sets that I'm interested in sharing out. I call it my uh, goal open data, create a description. And just with a few clicks, what I've done is I created this really nice portal, a public link, very, very simple. Um, if anybody goes to that link, what they will see is um, the data that's the raw data has been shared with them. Um, they can go here, for example, if I wanted to export uh, the sand traps, uh, they can simply go pick the file that they want. If they wanted a SQLite file or a file geodatabase out of this, um, they hit download and they can download that data out. And, and we're constantly improving this. Um, and we're looking for feedback about the types of features that you're looking for. But this link right here is public. Anybody can go to it. And I welcome you to go and try this out yourself. So far, any questions? Now look at the questions. Um, yes, asset management application. Somebody's asking if they can import data into an asset management application. And the answer is yes. We actually support. Um, we actually support multiple enterprise. What I've been showing you is how is it that you work detached from your uh, enterprise system. Uh, one thing that is very, very interesting is that you can interact with uh, a pre-existing system, being an ESRI system, an RGIS system. Um, and Daniel is going to show a little bit about that. Um, the reason why we can do that is that if you actually hit developer API here, you, what you'll see is that everything that I've shown you, everything that I've done can be done programmatically. 100% of all the things that I've done can be done through an API. I mean, we have an API browser. Uh, for those of you that are developers, this might make sense. For those of you that are not, this is just maybe gibberish. Um, but the main message being here that if you're a developer, you can basically do the geospatial SQL, you can generate the maps automatically, you can do the ETL in the cloud, all um, you know, by using your favorite programming language. So if you're trying to use GeoJSON, you can do GeoJSON. If you're uh, using XML, you can use XML, that sort of thing. Uh, Daniel, you, you want to talk a little bit about, um, I think we're running out of time. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the RGIS uh, integration? Sure. Um... As Raji just showed you, Amigo Cloud has an end-to-end -end solution for being able to do uh, data collection, analyzation, visualization, and data sharing out. However, it, the reality is um, many organizations already have an enterprise system, and most of the organizations that we see out there have an Esri uh, enterprise, or enterprise um, environment. Um, so I'm going to show my screen. I'm going to go through how we... Uh, integrate. Uh, here I have a simple project I created for Amigo Cloud, um, or I'm, I'm going to create a new project here uh, for the webinar. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, sync my data from ArcGIS into this project. And then from there it will sync into my phone. So here I have ArcMap. Um, I've loaded in a, a parcel data set here. Um, if we look at the parcel data set really quickly, uh, we can see some interesting things. I have two data types that have coded value domains, um, and then some other information about the parcels. I also have a relationship class to um, these parcel inspections right here. 
many, many enterprise workflows uh, are similar to this. It doesn't matter where the, whether you have like parcels and you're going to inspect those parcels or you have invasive species, you're going to inspect the invasive species and do treatments on it or you're doing trail maintenance or you're doing road maintenance. Uh, most large enterprise systems are, are rarely changing their geographic data. They only do that when there's changes to the actual earth, like a building's getting built or something, um, or they're putting in a new pipeline. Most of the time, they're actually just um, visiting the data that already exists, doing an inspection or maintenance on it, and needing to keep track of that in order to, to track um, what needs to be done and allocate budgets and things like that. So this for this workflow, uh, Amigo Cloud works really well. Um, so I just take these three, these, this data set and the inspection data set, and I run the geoprocessing tool, and you type in your username um, and password. Put in the name of the project, and then you just drag your feature classes over to it. Yeah, then you click OK. And what it'll do the first time is it will sync all of those data sets. It, it orders them to make sure they're synced in the right order and brings them all into the website. All right, and then it succeeded. So we could look on the website. We see I have my new project. We have our data sets collected to it. And then we look at the mobile device, and I can already see that uh, the project is there as well. Um, it's going to begin syncing uh, the data sets to this project. And while that's syncing to the phone, let's take a look at it, what it looks like here on the web. So when we look at a parcel on the web, I can look at this, this little parcel here. We can see it imported all of the data. We also have our pick lists like we wish. I just changed that from commercial to residential and um, changed that from shop to sport. Um, this allows you to, to keep track of your parcels. You can also um, view your uh, related data. So if you want to view the inspections on this data, you can click um, add or edit records. Uh, the data is syncing back to I don't have any records here, so we can add a new one. Uh, we'll choose today, or yes, we'll, we'll choose yesterday as the inspection. Um, then we'll give it a parcel value of $20,000 and a parcel type of residential and save that out. Um, this allows us to keep track of, of your individual um, inspections that you do on, every, on all the parcels as you go from year to year or month to month. If we look back at the mobile device, the data is all synced now. We can turn on our parcels, and we can it'll zoom in. These are parcels around outside Lake Merritt, and they draw. And we can zoom in. I can select the parcel and uh, edit the inspections, and we can see that these are the inspections for that parcel. Um, if I want to add a new inspection. I can click Add, create another inspection date, the January 17th, save that, give a parcel value of $34,000, done, change the parcel type to industrial, and click Save. The records are being submitted back to the web immediately, and then um, the web will begin to update. Now, Raji's already shown you all the workflow there, so I don't want to get into that. Um, but to bring those changes back into your enterprise system, all you have to do is rerun the geoprocessing tool. And what this is going to do is go and connect with Amigo Cloud to bring the changes back in. You can see that the changes were found there, and they're being inserted back into the database here. Um, and then you're, you're basically done. And now I have my inspections there. So uh, does anybody have any questions about that? I can't see the questions, Raji, so if you have anybody. Uh, the like question me. that we had here was from, let's see, oh, from Anna Whipple. And basically she was asking 
if we were limited to OSM as the base map? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, basically, if you're using uh, RGIS online or some other service, you can always connect to it and use base maps uh, provided for you through your RGIS online account or through uh, some other provider. Um, and uh, Daniel, maybe I can do a cool show. Awesome. Also, if you have your own custom base map that you use uh, exposed as a web mapping service, you can use that with Amigo Cloud as well. Right. Uh, can you show that, perhaps? Uh, sure. Let me bring up Amigo Cloud here. Yes. Sir. Uh, let's go back to the project and go to base layers. Mm -hmm. And here you can add a new base layer in. Let me bring up a base layer really quick. Uh, just a second, I have to, to look one up. There's one right there, I think, in the, the URL. Oh, yeah, there's that one. This is the USGS high-res imagery, if you need high-resolution imagery in your area. Save that out. And there it is. And if your base layer ever changes, you can clear the cache out. And then um, it will be available for your, uh, your map. There it is, USGS high-res imagery. And so you can use your own custom base layers, or you can uh, um, use one of the Esri base layers that we exposed right through here, too. Like dark gray, this is an Esri base you layer. You have to zoom out. I think they, they only have a certain uh, zoom level that they support. Yeah. Yeah, try the gray one. I think that's what they call it. Yeah, there's light gray. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, those excellent questions. I think we have four more minutes. There's another question that we have here. Um, API access from other applications. Uh, yes, we actually, if you're using Python, we have Python samples in our GitHub. Let me uh, share my screen really quick. Um, one second. Make myself presenter and uh, show my screen. Should be able to see my screen here. So if you actually are interested in the in the developer aspect, um, we have a GitHub account that uh, shows and their Amigo samples that will show you how to use Python or JavaScript uh, to do queries, to access the data, to uh, you know basically do anything that we can do through the web interface. You should be able to do that programmatically. And you know, I welcome you to email us if you have any questions. We're still working on making the documentation better every day. So it's uh, any feedback is extremely appreciated. Um, one last question here um, is uh, if Daniel, the, the question I think is for you. It says, will that toolbox be updated as R3 products are updated? It's talking about your uh, geoprocessing tool. Yes, we'll update it as Esri products are updated. It's a geoprocessing tool, and so it makes it very flexible to use it across different platforms. You can use it in our catalog. You can use it in ArcMap. You can also write a Python script that accesses it. Um, but we do need to recompile it at every version of the uh, ArcGIS releases because ArcGIS changes their libraries every release. Um, so it's a, a simple matter for us to just get the new release and recompile it and do some, some basic testing and get that out to you. Great. I think we're running out of time. Um, there are questions related to uh, the sync tool. 
Um, I would just say that the geoprocessing sync tool is not something that we have put out on the website yet. It's part of our enterprise offering. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, just uh, go ahead and email me or email Daniel at uh, you know Raji at amigocloud.com or Daniel at amigocloud.com, and we will be happy to uh, you know send you a copy of that. So. Uh, Without further ado, I think our time is up. I wanted to thank everybody for uh, standing uh, around and uh, putting up with the technical difficulties. Uh, we will send you a, uh, a questionnaire at the end of this. Uh, and uh, any feedback, if you have questions, please contact us through the website, through direct email at info at amigocloud.com. We want to hear from you. We want to get feedback. We want to help you and understand the needs. So we are actually building software that is uh, good for everybody. And uh, thank you so much for attending. Well, we'll see you soon.